Hey there, it's been a little while. I uh, want to provide an update and a bit of a how-to for the attenuator kit. At this time, I'm what I want to cover is the essentially the finished product. So this is courtesy of Fruto Technology, and we're able to produce a, an actual single board device. And what this is, it combines everything into the same sort of easy to use package uh, that we've used elsewhere on the GP Star kit. Uh, this includes the vibration motor, the piezo buzzer. There are direct connections for the bar graph, uh, for the toggles, for the uh, rotary encoder on top, all of the LED lights, which are basically uh, just uh, NeoPixels. And this is for your connection back to the pack, plus a few extra ports using the few remaining pins uh, just for future expansion should we decide, oh, there's actually a use for that. It's already exposed and available. Uh, the packaging uses the same 30-pin uh, ESP Room 32 that I've been using. Um, that that chipset uh, is basically just an off-the-shelf component. It is directly soldered onto this board. So again, no soldering necessary. Everything is going to take uh, screw terminals. Uh, these are a little bit smaller uh, than what we've used in the past, but I think on par with, uh, if you have used the Fruto Cyclotron uh, lid lights, I believe they had switched over to using uh, these tinier, uh, smaller uh, terminal blocks. So that's, that's the outline on this component. Uh, when you receive your kit, I believe I've seen all of the parts that should go into it. You will get, obviously, the controller. You will get a string of these uh, pre-made LEDs. You'll get two flat paddle toggles. These are a little uh, wider and kind of uh, nicer, have a nice satisfying clunk on them. Uh, so these will be your toggles. You will also get a rotary encoder, a rotary encoder with a DuPont connector, a five pin DuPont uh, should be, or either five pin or ind five individual wires. I can't remember precisely. Uh, this, this wire harness I made myself, uh, just ordered the parts, uh, separate wires, separate connectors, and I just made my own. Uh, you should get all of the wiring. Uh, the colors may differ slightly, uh, but we'll we'll get into a brief uh, how-to. The good news is everything is labeled. There is a label on every part here. There's a label on every part here. So it's really just going to be a matter of matching up label to label, and you're good. So, yeah, in addition to the toggles, the lights, the rotary encoder, the wires to connect it, uh, let's see, you'll also get a, a, a Fruto bar graph because the device does have a bar graph. Uh, let me point out, this is a new version. It's, it's subtle, but this is, a, uh, this is printed on a black PCB and it has a 3.0 label. If you look in this very corner, uh, Fruto Technology... 28 seg 3.0 versus the 2.0. So if you have purchased one of these for your Neutrona wand, just know that this is a different product from this, and this, the 3.0, is specifically made to work with this device. Why? Um, I'll cover that just as a FYI. So basically what this includes is pull-up resistors that are necessary on the data pins. They're not present on this because this was used with the, um, if I get this right, the AT Mega 2560 chip and packaging in the uh, GP Star pack, uh, wand controller. And that had built in uh, pull up resistors. The ESP doesn't. So Fruto made a new version of this uh, to work with the controller for the attenuator. So just as an FYI, I wanted to point that out, so should you connect up the bar graph and it doesn't work, if you didn't use the 3.0 the 3 version, uh, that would be why. 
Uh, see what else. Uh, in terms of the the shell, depending on which shell you got, whether it was plastic or metal, uh, you should get a few a few accessories. You should get some sort of a uh, lens insert plus the radiation lens. Uh, those uh, just fit together. You should also receive a flange of some sort uh, of, of matching material. That, mat, that mates to a little glass dome. You see there's even these little uh, pegs so that it fits in. And you'll be able to glue those together and then you can glue this onto your shell. Uh, same with this, uh, this other light, the lens. Uh, the whole assembly goes together. Actually, if I just put it together, see it's pretty much flush. These are precision parts here. So everything fits together and then this just glues on top. And then the last thing is going to be one of these tiny clip lights will go on the top of your attenuator. Uh, when it's mounted, it'll be on this top, uh, not the dial top. You'll also receive the, the, uh, the top dial, of course. You will get a length of wire in a braided cable. This is, this is one that I made. I believe the ones that are shipping are just a plain black nylon. This was uh, my, this is a cable I made. It will have a connector on one end, and we'll get to the assembly in a minute, but on the other end, you're gonna have just bare wires, which will screw directly into the controller. And then lastly, you'll receive something like this. Again, this one I made, um, but you should get something similar to it. It's basically the other end of the socket. It's four pins and that mates up to uh, a power connector and a data connector. And this will connect to your pack controller. So I believe that is a rundown of all the major uh, components. Uh, your shell is going to be either a, let's see, it will be either a plastic resin or it will be one of the aluminum shells. So depending on which one you get, you'll, you'll get the right one. And you should also receive a bracket. So basically there's uh, two models of brackets. One fits uh, properly inside of the, uh, inside of the metal shell while, yeah. So this is going to, this little bracket, the uh, PCB, or we'll just do this real quick. So the PCB will fit either one of these, and it just sort of snaps into place. Put one side in, and there we go, yeah. And it just snaps in, and then it will sit inside. This, uh, the important part about this is, it gives you a place that you can actually adhere this little, uh, the vibration motor. You just pull off the backing, it's an adhesive backing, and you can just press it into this, this bracket, attach it to that, and then this thing just sits in the back of your attenuator, and then you can put the backing on it, and it's all closed up. So that's just to keep it from moving and rattling around. There'll be plenty of wires in there to keep it in place, but that should be it. So you'll get the you should get a bracket that matches the uh, internals of your shell. And just to show you, it's just a, there's slight differences because of the sizing, the thickness of the, yeah, see this won't even fit in the plastic one. It has to do with the uh, thickness on these. The metal is obviously much thinner because it has more strength and rigidity, but we need to bulk up the plastic one, otherwise it gets really flimsy. So, that should be the rundown of the parts. So, what about assembly? Well, in your kit, you should get a, a brief document from Frito on how to connect everything, and it's really quite simple. I'm gonna kind of walk through it here. The, this is a previously attached, uh, everything's been assembled. 
So we have the power connections and the data connections will come in here. So we got uh, ground, five volt positive, and then there will be labels on these. They are, they are very tiny. They are very tiny. Uh, but they are labeled according to what they connect to. So it says TX1 and RX1. That means the TX1 and the RX1 on the pack. So you, if you were to trace the wires back, you would be able to figure out exactly what it's supposed to connect to. So that's the, the TX and the RX connections here, the yellow and the, and the um, white. We have the bar graph, which needs power and data. So that will use the uh, five volt here, as well as the SDA, SCL. And then your two uh, toggles will just plug right in. You got the left toggle and the right toggle. So, and then when you're looking at the device, uh, this would be right, this would be left. So when you're looking at it, that's how it's arranged. All right, and for the NeoPixels, uh, the labels on the back, basically the red stripe on the wire is positive. The one in the middle is data, and the one on the far opposite side is ground. Real simple. And then, like I said, for the rotary encoder, all you have to do is plug in the wires on one end and make sure they match up on the other side. So if ground is black for mine, all I need to do is make sure that black goes to ground on the other side. And that's it. So now it's connected. And then basically once this gets installed, it'll be kind of folded over like this because this thing is going to be placed right, right above the chipset. And that's it. So that's, that's essentially the internals right there. No soldering, just a little bit of, um, you'll need a very tiny screwdriver uh, for these terminal blocks and the rest just uh, pops right in there. Oh yeah, and you will get a um, you will get this strain relief boot is part of the assembly. So on the other side of the wire, you'll have this thing. There is an outer and an inner portion of this. If you need to move this, so basically, you would insert this end with the bare wires. Will go through the bottom, the bottom of the attenuator. So wire sheath comes in this side, bare wires on the inside. And if you need to move this thing, just unscrew the bottom of the strain relief boot and this will slide quite easily. And then once you have given yourself enough slack inside the device, just tighten it down. And now that won't move. And then on the inside, you just thread this nut over it, so this nut will be on the inside. And just tighten that down and that will squeeze onto the uh, shell and hold that in place. And then it's just gonna be a matter of wire management inside of the device, making sure that everything fits and is routed correctly. So we'll do that in just a moment, but what I wanted to, let's see, I think we've got, yeah, we've got all the major components. Uh, let's let's go ahead and cover this real quick before I forget. So remember, this is going to use TX1 and RX1. So on your little pigtail, this, I'll start by saying, this will be mounted pretty much wherever you like. Uh, there's only, I think maybe it's a, a six inch cable. So there's not a lot of distance uh, that you'll have unless you get like some extensions for this but you can pretty much fit this anywhere you want on your pack. Uh, hole that you will need to drill into the side of your pack, so you will need a hole to the outside. You will push this through. It does come with a nut that threads on, so you'll thread the nut on from the back, and then this will be sandwiched um, the outside of your pack, and then this will be on the inside of your pack and you'll just tighten that down, and now you'll have a connection point so you can disconnect the attenuator whenever you wish uh, if you do uh, need to do mods or maintenance. So that's the outside. The wires will run. Uh, you'll have your data connection going into the TX1, the TX1 and RX1 port, 
and this will make use of the 5 volt out, which is in the top corner. And that, again, is just a matter of matching up the cable, make sure the polarity is correct. It should be set already. Uh, for this one, red and black is uh, positive and negative, respectively. For the other side, it should be properly wired and oriented, so it just plugs right in. And that's it. So that's, that's your connection to the pack. And then once you connect this into the aviation, the other side of the aviation socket, you can tighten it down. And now that's nice and solid. So that's, that's about it. And then, of course, this is on the outside of the pack. You will have uh, the ability to, to thread that on. So that about covers the basics of the installation. Uh, I, there's not a lot more to it than that. Uh, that will be enough uh, if you want to do a bench test and make sure everything works. I would encourage that before you do too much work uh, with the shells. So get everything assembled, plug it in, make sure everything works, you know, flip the switches, make sure it comes on, make sure it powers on the pack. That is, in a nutshell, the electronics portion. Let's talk about the externals. So let's talk primarily about painting and weathering. And the idea here was these, these were designed with customizability in mind. So when you receive your attenuator, it is unfinished. It is unfinished because this, this is not a Canon part. Uh, it, is, it was something that was created aftermarket. Uh, Adam Savage and other makers have created these. Everyone I have seen uh, who creates these does something a little bit different. You may want yours to look like it was fresh from the factory, not aged a day, pristine condition. That's your prerogative. Go for it. Same with if you want it to look beat up and weathered, you can do that. The process of painting and weathering, should, we decided, should be left to the end user. I'm going to start with the resin uh, design first. Both shells externally are exactly the same. Same dimensions, same uh, Greebly's screws, everything uh, is gonna be exactly the same. The main difference is the thickness of the walls and the way that you will finish these. So the resin is perfectly smooth. This is, this is a great product. You can see there's a little bit of a, a, a pattern on mine. That's actually from the bubble wrap when it was shipped from the manufacturer. That will completely go away once it's painted. It, I'm not concerned about this. So this is directly from uh, shipping. This is ready to go. Uh, if you want to paint this, what I would recommend is using a bit of this product here, this paint adhesion promoter. Hit it with this, uh, you know, make sure it's clean, and then you can cover it with something like this, uh, metallic aluminum, if you want to have like a metal, a metal undercarriage kind of look. And when you do that, you will end up with this. So these are the same uh, devices. This is a slightly earlier version that uh, didn't have the bezel uh, on the top around the bar graph, but they are still exactly the same uh, shell designs. They, uh, same materials, but you see, nice and smooth. I really, I didn't do any, any finishing, no sanding whatsoever before I, uh, before I put paint on it. I should have, I had a little blemish here uh, when I was painting, I left a, a drip on the side. I'm actually gonna use that to my advantage. I'm probably gonna mask that off and make that look like a, a paint chip or some sort of blemish uh, from use. Which brings me to the next point, which is, okay, you wanna do weathering. So the typical way to do the weathering is to do a two-tone paint job. So first you would have this, you would get it to a metallic state. You can see I didn't do a great job. That's going to be on the inside. Uh, so I've got a metallic finish. And if you get the metal uh, enclosure, you're already metallic. So basically, I'm at the same state of finishing for both of these. This one's already metal. This one looks like metal. I'm ready for the next step. Uh, the next step, and I'll, I'll come back to the aluminum shell in a minute. Uh, the next step is something like this, 
This is a liquid latex masking fluid. And what you can do with this is, first off, this comes out really watery. So you want something like a little, a little cup, pour a little bit into this. And then you want something, you want this. Uh, this is a silicone brush. I have already made the mistake of trying to use regular paint brushes with this. The problem is the latex will will dry fairly quickly. And once it starts drying, it kind of becomes like rubber cement. It gets really stringy, really goopy, and it sticks to everything. And I, you can't clean it out of a brush. It, it's impossible. So a silicone brush, uh, these are made for clay finishing. Uh, I got a little kit with a bunch of different size brushes. These are perfect. The, the latex will not stick to these, that, uh, meaning you can actually clean these off and continue using them. Uh, at worst, the little, uh, the little end pops out uh, for cleaning. But basically, just dip this into your little cup with the masking fluid. And what you do is you just sort of dab it or paint it on and just put it in areas where you would have high wear and tear. So think about where you want to wear it on your pack, if you're a lefty or a righty, um, you know, where, where you're going to put it and think about how you would, you know, if you were moving in your uniform, where would the uh, wear patterns be? And so you just dab on the latex masking fluid anywhere you want. Doesn't matter if it's plastic, if it's uh, aluminum, this will, this will stick to it. And you can do it in layers. So if you want to add more, let the first layer dry and then come back with uh, fresh uh, latex and dab it on. Just remember, it may stick to the brush. So just keep, the, keep this uh, brush wet when you add more to it. The alternative to this is toothpaste, plain, ordinary, like the white toothpaste, not gel. That's another trick used in modeling uh, and for doing weathering. The whole idea is you want to mask areas where you don't want the paint to uh, permanently adhere, and you're just doing little spots. Because what you'll do after that, once it's all dried, is you will use something like this. Now, this is my preference. You can use uh, whatever color you want. If you wanted to mask this off and do like the uh, black and yellow stripes on it, feel free. This is what I used. Um, I like this, the truck bed liner, because it goes on a really thick coat, like just right out. It's a high powered spray. It will go on thick. It will give you a thick coat. So when you, at the end, you're going to peel and rub off the latex or the toothpaste to reveal the silver paint or the metal underneath. And you kind of want that look of the paint actually being chipped away. And so having a thick coat of paint, either one coat should, should suffice. You can hit it with a second coat if you want. That is definitely going to give the look of the paint has flaked and peeled off. If you want to add something else, get some acrylic paints, uh, get some plain black, uh, some uh, burnt sienna. Those are uh, those are good for griming things up a bit more, so make it look dirty. Uh, you can add uh, other types of browns to make it look like oils and dirts. The, um, it's quite easy to do like a rust effect as well, uh, like around some of the screws. Those are the weathering techniques I can, I can share uh, easily. Let's talk briefly about the aluminum. So uh, the aluminum, when it comes to you, by default, it has a, sort of a sandblasted texture. Basically, once they remove any of the excess uh, metallic powder that was used to create this. So this is 3D printed. It's just uh, uh, basically laser centered. So the it's a powder. It's heated with a laser. It melts, and that's your the, those are your layer lines. In fact, you won't even really see layer lines on this. You'll just have sort of a rough texture on it. You can easily sand that down. So you could see the difference is this one's a little shinier, a little smoother. You can do that very quickly with a sanding sponge. Uh, wet this. So these can be sold, uh, picked up at most um, home improvement stores. Just look in the paint department. You'll find sanding sponges. 
soak these down in water, makes it a lot easier. And then just work over the aluminum, ideally in one direction. You'll kind of get sort of a brushed metal look if you just keep consistently, you know, sanding in one one contiguous direction. On this one, I kind of did sort of down on the sides and down on the front and kept that same that same direction going all the way down from the, the top down the front face. When you are done, if, if you sand this and you want it that, that, that smoothness, either way, before you paint the aluminum, make sure you wash this with soap and water. And that's to make sure that no oils have transferred from your fingers to the metal. So use something like a, a soap a dish detergent, something that really can break down uh, oils. Just give it a good soap and water rinse, uh, soap and water wash, rinse it well, let it dry. And then when you're doing like the masking and the painting, just wear gloves. I just use those to make sure that I don't, again, uh, get any oils from my fingers on the metal because I want to make sure that the paint bonds to this and it re and it will. The, the truck bed liner so far, I have not had any issues with it uh, on my aluminum shell. It, it goes on and it stays on. You can also get uh, any paint that is uh, referred to, basically Rust-Oleum is made to go onto metal, but anything that is a direct to metal paint, it's uh, usually an alkaline based paint and that will, that will bond directly to the metal. Those are the tips and tricks I have for weathering your devices on the exterior. And then of course, you, you can figure out when you want to add any of the screws. Those should be shipped and sent to you as well. So there's uh, screws that will go in the top for decoration. There's screws on the side. Again, this is all just to make it look like it's, you know, assembled from multiple uh, pieces, even though this is mostly a unibody uh, design. All right, so we've talked about the electronics and assembling those components together. We've talked a little bit about how to weather and paint your uh, shells, the, the exteriors. So what we should probably do now is talk a bit about the assembly into this device itself. Like I said, this is, you're probably gonna wanna start with this and the rotary encoder first because they are going on, they are going deepest into this uh, device. For this, uh, the first light is number one. One is going up at the top. You should get some little plastic clips that will snap directly over these lights and those will help them stay put or more precisely, they will, they will make it easier for you to glue into the shell. So once you've clipped, clipped on the little brackets, you'll put them inside the device here. They will fit You'll have to do some wire management, but the the lights will basically shine through or ideally, I think the way I had done the brackets, um, they should pretty much sit flush. So then once you add the lights on top, everything, everything sort of just, it works. Um, the lights shouldn't interfere with the lenses, vice versa. And that's it. So you've got... Uh, one is up here, so this is the top, this is the upper, and then this is the lower. So this this big hole right here, that's the that's the lower one. Also, I think the the reason why the you should get the little uh, clips for these is it also helps for the metal one. It insulates and makes sure that there's no uh, electronics that are going to somehow touch the metal. So I don't have the I'm not doing an actual assembly here, so I'm just sort of paying this lip service as to how this works. You see, there should there's plenty of room to get the point from point A to point B. You should have enough room uh, to have this wire routed around and to all of the necessary lights. So you should end up with a bit of excess wire so you can push it to the side and make room for it to, to route through. All right, so that's that's the LED lighting. The next is the rotary encoder. So the rotary encoder, 
will have a threaded post because you're gonna have a small nut on the end of this. And by the way, if you do have a washer that's a, uh, attached to it, you could probably just set that aside. Both of these shells were designed so that the thickness, this little square right here, this is the same thickness, whether you are the metal shell or the resin shell. And that is, reason for that is to ensure that only the bare minimum sticks above the surface. So once you get that pushed through, that's it. Now the rotary encoder is on there and this is a, you'll have the push action and you'll have the turn action. And that's what it looks like from the inside. You probably want these wires facing down just because when this is mounted, it's gonna fit right there. Sorry, let me show a different angle. So it's going to fit on the side that has the, the vents. And so you'll, you'll probably need to be, yeah, I can already tell the wires. You may have to squish them down to get everything to fit right. But for them, but I can tell you that there is plenty of room. Let's see if I can show this. There's plenty of room between the encoder and the top of this controller, even when it's in its little bracket, nothing should, nothing should interfere. You're just going to have some fun routing the wires and getting everything uh, squished in there. So, so that's the first part. You should probably do the rotary encoder first. Then you can work on the toggles. There should be plenty of room. You should end up with sort of two, two washers. You're going to have a lock washer underneath, and you're going to have this little washer as well. If you put these on first and just leave them on, just push that up through and you can see clearances are pretty, pretty tight. All right. Now be careful when you, when you go to tighten this down because you could mar the surface getting it just tight enough that it stays in place. I would suggest using a better player, pair of pliers. But that's it. That's... I remember these are labeled, so left toggle and right toggle. And the intent is that uh, when you are looking at this, this is right, this is left. And if you get it wrong, it's okay. Just unplug the, the, at the ports here and just swap them. The only reason why this is important is the right toggle is the one that is currently set with the action of turning the pack on, while the left toggle essentially turns the attenuator itself on and off. So if for whatever reason, uh, you don't want the lights on, you can turn this off by flipping it up, and it will also silence the buzzing and the beeping. So when you go into overheat, it will prevent the device from making any sounds as well as uh, showing any lights. Oh, and I've already made a mistake. I've got one mounted up and one mounted down. So I've got it marked. So these, so on the side that has the two wires, that is off. So when you have it flip, the toggle flipped in that direction, it's off. If you flip it the other way, it's on. So if it helps you put a little mark on it. So that's my, my one for on, zero for off. That way, when I'm installing it, I know right away if I've got the right orientation. So when I flip the toggle, is it going to be on or is it going to be off? All right. And then the bar graph. So this one, I want to show one quick little thing. So on here, you see the way that it solders on those two pins or the two connectors? There's four little pins here. By default, those are, those are a little long. 
you can do one of two things here. You can get some snips and just, just nip the tip. Don't, don't snap off the entire solder joint, but just the, just the very tops of the, very tops of the wire that comes through. Basically it's the, it's the pins for those sockets. The reason why uh, you might want to do that is especially if you have the metal, the metal model here, you see that inside lip. First off, this is going, this is going to be a tight fit uh, by design. It's, it's going to be very close. Uh, but it is also metal and you don't want to short anything out. So you can do one of two things. You can snip those. You can also get a little bit of electrical tape, which I just happen to have here. And if just cut a little tiny piece off and just lay that over those points. There we go. Just to make sure that nothing touches the metal and causes any unexpected uh, shorts. And you know what? I realize I'm, I'm installing this on the, the version that doesn't have the bezel. Let me show you what it actually looks like on that on this version. There we go. So that's what it looks like on the version that has the bezel. And this is kind of why we added it. There's actually a backstop. So when you push the bar graph in, it will, it will hit a point that it won't go in any further. Stop. You're done. It's installed. Uh, so that's... That's a safety to make sure that it doesn't, you know, doesn't push all the way through. What you still might want to do is just put some hot glue. Hot glue will work just fine here. Uh, same thing for use the hot use hot glue to attach the uh, LEDs with their little brackets into the into the shell. Okay. So yeah, I'm I'm installing in the version that doesn't have the bezel, so I I would definitely want to glue this in place so that I keep the, the bar graph flush. But we put the be bezel around it, just the one to protect it, and two, it, it looks nicer. All right, so let's, let's pretend that I've got everything uh, installed here. Let's grab our correct bracket. I think that is, yep, that's the right one. And let's put the bracket, or the, uh, PCB into the bracket. All right. And let's just pretend that I have actually installed all of the lights. Actually, the way that this is going in, you may end up wanting to do the lights last. I can already see this is getting the wire from the front all the way to the top or from the bottom to the top. All right, and there we go. So is it tight? Yeah, uh, you'll, you'll definitely, once, you're, once you've got everything in here, you'll wanna tighten it. Oh, I forgot the cable. Okay, so the, the cable obviously is going to go, I would have to unscrew it here. I don't have my screwdriver handy. Uh, you would not attach this first. So don't, don't do like I did. Don't attach this first. It will go through the bottom here. Then this nut threads on from the back. Now this stays put. Give yourself enough slack uh, for this wire to reach all the way up here. And then before you tuck everything in here, you can attach the, uh, the wires to the terminal blocks and you're done. So it, it's a little loosey goosey here. Uh, it's not fully, it's not fully assembled, but for the most part, that's enough to show, yes, that that's, that's essentially what it'll look like. Your toggles, everything clears the, uh, clears the backside. There's plenty of room in here. I, I am so happy with this design from Fruto. I am glad that they were able to, to make this happen. This is not what the inside of my attenuator looks like. Mine is an absolute rat's nest and has that uh, uh, proto board in there. So I've got even more crap shoved into mine. This is nice and compact. I think you all be uh, happy with the way that um, 
this kind of all fits together nicely. So, all right, so that's it. So a, kind of a, a rough, uh, rough estimate, a rough um, idea of how everything goes together. We've run through the parts, run through uh, some basic assembly, the electronics hookup, painting and weathering. So hopefully that will get you pointed in the right direction once your kit arrives and you begin assembling this yourself. So hope that is informational. With that, I'm gonna call this video segment done. Uh, if there's uh, more questions or need for additional videos, uh, I'll make those as it comes up. But that's about all I have uh, in my head at this time for what I wanted to go over. So take that, run with it, and enjoy. Talk to you later.